Yay. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, Aaron, I'm going to give a, a short intro here. Sounds good. And let's see, share. And there's this. And I want to slideshow. And from the beginning. Okay, hope you guys can see this. I am screen sharing. Uh, I want to welcome you. Uh, you get an extra gold star for making this meeting. I'm sorry for the, the delay and all. Uh, but we are the Herring Ponds Watershed Association, and we are really happy to have Aaron Keaton here. We will be exploring the world of fungi with Aaron. And let's see, how do I? We, uh, what is the HPWA? You see a, a nice aerial view of our 11 ponds. Uh, we are an ACEC, an area of critical environmental control of 4,450 yes, acres, 11 ponds. And our main focus is LHP, Little Herring Pond, Great Herring Pond, and Elbow Pond. Our mission statement is to preserve and protect the water and the land. We are all volunteer board of directors. We are people. We are 270 members worth and over 500 on our mailing list. Here's a, a map of us uh, on the east. You can see the, uh, the, Cape, uh, the Cape Cod Bay. To the north, you see both Great Herring Pond, Little Herring Pond. And to the south is the Cape Cod Canal. We were founded in 2007. We've been watering monitor, water, whew, monitoring water quality, quality continuously since 2008. We've got an excellent partnership with the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs in Plymouth. And we have just completed and heard uh, our water quality plan from our consultant, Ed Eichner of the SMAST. Okay, we got another person here. We uh, are not idle. We have done a lot of things. My wife does educational newsletters and she was the one who arranged this presentation with Aaron, who we, I, I have to say again, that we're really excited to hear about his, his expertise. And let's see, somebody else coming in. We are going to be Saturday, April, I think it's the 22nd, actually, that could be outdated. We have a herring festival and we have a obstacle course for the children to mimic what the herring do going up and going down on a slide that was very popular last year. Lee Poulos, who is here, has done two editions of stewardship guide for people, you know, a, a layman's uh, guide to what's important for water quality. We do E. coli testing at more than just the beaches, just to keep an eye on whether we can detect a uh, failed septic system or not. We've dealt with cyanobacteria blooms two out of the last three years. We've helped the town of Plymouth purchase some of our recharge land. With Plymouth, we have remediated three runoff sites already. They've gotten the grants. We have the draft report of the water quality plan, and we have basically uh, presented that to our membership and we're ready to start. We'll be doing that Thursday, a meeting to see how we're going to go forward with this. This is our board of directors, minus three very important people. Uh, we have a new education chair, Tess Goldman, and we have a new committee, a social committee. We're going to try to get to know people better uh, on a personal basis and do things like uh, boat parades and nighttime movies and uh, boat tours of the, of the pond to uh, share with people what we know about the pond. So the star of the show is Aaron Keaton. And it's a great picture he's sent. And I thought that would be the first thing you should see of him. We are going to be exploring the world of fungi. 
Aaron grew up in Plymouth and he's a graduate of Keene State College, which is in New Hampshire, as probably most of you know. And this is where he learned to be a mycologist. He was taking pictures of, of mushrooms without even knowing that he was going to fall in love with mushrooms. He studied fungi throughout New Hampshire. And now that he's based in Plymouth, he's studied mushrooms in Plymouth and fungi. Why would anybody ever do that? Well, I think he's going to tell us that tonight, but some of us know that fungi have a very important ecological role. role. They provide benefits for the environment. They're useful as food and medicine. And as a chemist, I can appreciate that. And they have an impact on culture. So the presentation will discuss the role of fungi in the local environment. This is, this is a very focused talk on what's going on in Plymouth. And the part that they play in the Pine Barrens, which as most of you know, is a very unique environment. There's only three of them in the whole world and we have the second largest one here and how they affect the health and stability of the forest ecosystems. So let's learn about the fungi around us so that we can start looking out for them. So Aaron, I'm done. And let me make sure that you can share screen. I'm going to stop and let's see, share screen. I'm going to allow multiple participants. So you should be able to share. Look at that. I'm glad somebody has functioned on all cylinders. All right. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you, Don, for the introduction and for um, setting this up and giving the platform for this talk. So I'm Aaron Keaton, as Don mentioned, and um, I've been studying mushrooms for almost four years now. Um, I started when I was in college um, and it's really become basically my whole life now. Uh, I would describe myself as an independent researcher. So uh, no one is employing me to do this, but um, I just identified mushrooms. I've started my own mycology lab at the Center Hill Preserve. And there I just um, basically take spore prints, uh, samples of mushrooms, uh, look under them with the microscope, uh, grow out cultures, stuff like that to really learn more about them. I'm constantly taking photos. I probably have, if not a thousand, more than a thousand photos of fungi all over New England. Um, I try to post them online so that other people can kind of um, gain that information as well. And I've also made a couple of field guides. Uh, my first field guide was for the Monadnock region in New Hampshire. I'm currently working on one for the Mount uh, White Mountain region and Hopefully we'll maybe do my own of Plymouth and Cape Cod. But um, yeah, I really just wanted to do this talk because I love mushrooms. Uh, they're very important, not only for the environment, but for us as people. They've been used as medicine for thousands of years um, in rituals and stuff like that. Um, many cultures use them primarily as medicine and as food. So they're kind of um, have a lot of different roles, but mostly today we'll be talking about their role in our globally rare Pine Barren ecosystem. So what makes Southeastern Massachusetts a unique ecosystem for fungi? Well, unlike many other forested regions, we have very sandy soil. And this sandy soil is nutrient deprived and leaches readily meaning that it doesn't really hold water or nutrients well. So the various plants and trees that grow around here have adapted to grow this way um, with the health of fungi. So many people, when they think of fungi, think of a mushroom, but the mushroom is really only the visible part of an underground network known as mycelium. So basically how an apple grows from a tree the mushroom grows from the mycelium, which can kind of be compared to roots, but it's very different than roots. So 
There are a couple of dominant species in our area, as you probably know, pitch pine and scrub oak um, are a few that are very dominant in this region. And they have adapted um, mycorrhizal relationships with fungi so that they can survive here. They really depend on their deep reaching roots to acquire all the nutrients that they need to grow. Without fungi though, their roots wouldn't be nearly as long. They wouldn't be able to spread out through the soil um, like they need to, to actually survive. So the roots of many trees and plants have really become dependent on these mycorrhizal relationships with fungi to survive and to uh, be healthy. So these mycorrhizal relationships can also be called symbiotic relationships. Um, when you form symbiosis between two organisms, it's not um, a one-sided deal. Both participants are gaining benefits. So in this case, the hosts, the trees, they gain a widespread mycelium network, which enhances their ability to obtain water and nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, basically, if you were to think about the roots, you can kind of see in this picture, the roots are kind of brown. They dig out as much as they can, but it's really the mycorrhizae that extends off of the tips of roots and can go so much farther throughout the soil um, and basically the underground um, substrate. The mycorrhizae you can kind of see in the picture is um, more so the orange and pink and blue colors. So you can see how it really can kind of take over all the soil. Um, and kind of just like branches out. Um, in exchange, the fungi receive carbohydrates and vitamins, um, which are also essential for their growth um, through the trees. Fungi are unlike plants and trees. They do not make their own food. They cannot um, perform the process of photosynthesis. So they actually have to eat or consume something to gain their nutrients. So when fungi is unable to, you know, get those nutrients, the trees help them out and basically through the network, um, send those nutrients to the fungi and the fungi sends back um, various nutrients that the tree needs. So in our pine barren ecosystem, the harsh effects of sand, salt, dry conditions and the low concentration of nutrients really make um, the growth of these trees and plants difficult at best. So over time, the way that this ecosystem formed was really on the basis of these mycorrhizal relationships. Um, we wouldn't have the type of biodiversity we have if these relationships didn't occur. And really, um, the trees would grow much slower and sometimes not at all if they didn't have these relationships to depend on. So mushrooms uh, appear at many different times of the year. Uh, it's pretty common knowledge that most mushrooms fruit in response to rain or thunderstorms, but many species um, also wait until the hot summer months have passed. Uh, during the late summer, Amanita, Russula, Lactarius, or milk caps, and boletes are prominent. And then in the cooler periods during September, October, and November, many other species are allowed to prevail. Uh, in this region in particular, some of the earliest mycorrhizal relationships were relatives of the puffballs. So you'll see later, um, I have some example of puffballs puff uh, that you can find in this region. So, like I said, there's many types of mushrooms. Uh, one of the biggest groups are known as the guild mushrooms. And I would say this is probably what most people think when they think of a mushroom. Uh, they have a cap and stem with uh, blade-like gills on the underside. And they either have a central, eccentric, lateral, um, or are stalkless, which is basically the stem. The stem positions itself in many different ways. Um, and if we look at this mushroom to the left, um, the white one growing on the tree, that's an oyster mushroom. That's an example of a mushroom that really has no stem. Uh, and 
Gilled mushrooms really grow on a variety of substrates. Um, they have many habitats, soil, hummus, wood, sawdust, uh, the cones of trees, manure, and they come in an array of colors um, that tend to change as they grow older. And some have a universal veil, uh, which is also kind of known as like a skirt. It is left over from when the mushroom was young and then it kind of opens up and leaves it um, on the stem, kind of looks like a skirt. And that can be a pretty important factor when you're identifying gilled mushrooms, either the presence or absent, absence of a universal veil. Oops. So I'll go over some gilled mushrooms that I have found in this region pretty commonly. Um, obviously there's thousands, but these are just some that I have come across and that are known to be pretty common in this region. So this is the Amanita rubensis. Uh, it's also known as the blusher. It's pretty much a whitish tan Amanita, which Amanita mushrooms are one that most people know what they look like. They have these warts on them. Uh, but this one in particular is common July through October. Uh, it's pretty easy to ID because it has reddish stains on the cap with white warts. Um, and over time, the cap kind of turns a pinkish color. That's why it's called the blusher. And this mushroom is mycorrhizal with oaks. So if you're out looking for this mushroom or you see something that looks like this mushroom, if oak trees are around, um, that's a pretty good indicator that this may be the species you're looking at. Apparently it's edible, but definitely not recommended. Um, many ammonitas are poisonous. So it's just kind of like a genus that you really don't want to mess around with um, for food. But uh, apparently this one is edible, which surprised me. And one way that you get into identifying mushrooms is taking spore prints, uh, which is very easy. You just cut off the cap of a mushroom, lay it on a piece of paper or tin foil, put a drop of water on it, wait a few hours, lift up the cap, and there'll be a spore print, which is basically this pattern um, that the gills drop. They drop their spores and you'll see a pattern. They have all different colors. Um, this is like one of the first ways mycologists started identifying mushrooms um, and grouping them together was by spore print color. Uh, nowadays we have DNA analysis with PCR machines and stuff like that, but um, the DNA does tell us a lot, a lot that you cannot, you know, you could never know that information by just looking at the mushroom, but um, it can't tell you everything. Um, and when you're breaking down different genuses and species, um, spore prints are a very reliable way to do that. So I've, in, I've uh, included like the spore print color just for anyone who's interested. So this mushroom would actually drop a white spore print. And if it didn't drop a white spore print, it's definitely not this mushroom. Another one is Russula vinicea. Uh, this is kind of a wine red colored cap uh, that turns purple with age and has a dark center. Uh, this mushroom has an unusually long season, uh, June through October. It's very widespread, so it's pretty likely that you might come across this. Um, and it's one of the first mushrooms to appear after the winter. Uh, there's many russulas that are red with white caps, so this isn't um, an easy to identify mushroom, but it's a very common one, so I wanted to include it. It's mycorrhizal with oaks. Um, it is edible, but like I said, this is not an easy to ID mushroom, so definitely not an edible mushroom for beginners. And this one would drop a white spore print. This is Tapinella atrotomentosa, also known as the Velvet Foot Pax. Uh, this mushroom is, I think it's a pretty cool mushroom. It's very beautiful to me. Um, and it's easy to identify based on its dark brown hairs on the stalk or stem, which are pretty distinctive to this species. It also has gills that run down the stem, um, which isn't always seen um, with gilled mushrooms. Gilled mushrooms usually have them very attached to the cap, but this one actually 
runs down the stem, almost like chanterelles. Um, and this mushroom is usually found on conifer stumps or logs, but it's not mycorrhizal. So it doesn't have a relationship with conifers, but it is often found near conifer trees. It's fairly common in July through October. The edibility is unknown, so pretty much a void for food. And it drops a dull yellow spore print. This is another pretty common one, um, Tricholoma myomyces. Uh, it's very abundant in late fall um, and can be common throughout the summer, but mostly shows up in the fall. It has a distinctive smoky gray cap, uh, gray gills and a white stem. And this one is mycorrhizal with white pines. So if you're, you know, you come across a mushroom that looks like this, um, it's good to kind of look around and see what trees are around. Um, this one is usually found with white pines. Uh, the edibility is unknown. Um, and this one drops a white spore print. Chlorotis oschitis, uh, this is the oyster mushroom, very common mushroom, um, a great mushroom to start foraging for, um, is a pretty good mushroom to eat, tastes good, easy to just, you know, cook up. Uh, it grows in shelf-like clusters, they kind of stack up on one another, and they're usually white, but can kind of turn brownish, um, and all of them have white gills. Uh, they either have a stubby to no stem. Um, they're usually just growing on the side of trees. Um, and they often do grow on dead decaying logs. Sometimes you'll find them on trees that are knocked over. Um, they like conifers, but they can be on living trees as well. Like I said, they're edible and they drop a white spore print. This is one of my favorite mushrooms, honestly, um, Flamulina villette types. This mushroom was able to be found um, throughout the winter. So I really liked it because, you know, when you're foraging in the winter, you're not always going to find a mushroom like this. But um, every winter, I'm able to find this mushroom, like even when a frost has occurred. So I like how this mushroom can kind of be found um, even throughout the winter when you're not going to find many other ones. Um, it's usually growing on stumps, logs, or roots, um, but can be found living um, on the wood of hardwoods. Um, they are sticky or rubbery orange, um, can be kind of reddish, and they have kind of these palish yellow gills. Um, and they again have a distinctive velvety, uh, velvety stem that um, gives them the neck, uh, nickname. Um, think like the velvet foot uh, mushroom or something like that. Um, and then the stem also darkens in color. So it kind of starts off very brown and works its way up and, you know, kind of turns more orange. And like I said, it's fond of cold weather. Uh, usually in the late fall to winter, you'll find this mushroom. Uh, it's a pretty popular edible. Um, I think it's like sold in the grocery stores. Um, but it's not, it doesn't look anything like this. Um, they've cultivated it to look much different, but this is what a wild one would look like. And this spore print is white. Um, another pretty common mushroom, these are known as honey mushrooms, are malaria melia. Um, they are parasitic on wood, so um, they're pretty much using the wood as food and causing like rot and stuff in the wood. Uh, they can also be found growing directly from the soil um, as in this picture. They are yellow to brown with tiny little hairs on the cap and have off white gills. Um, and kind of how you know um, that you have a honey mushroom is it'll have a yellow ring around the stem, which is um, the broken veil or universal veil. So, that's a good way to try and identify this mushroom is the yellow ring. It's edible if you cook it um, very thoroughly and it has a white spore print. Um, and just a fun fact, the largest living organism on the planet is actually a honey mushroom in Oregon um, that is about 2,400 years old. 
Uh, they estimate it to be maybe as old as 8,000 years old, but it runs four square miles um, underground, um, which is pretty cool. Another large group of mushrooms that you're definitely going to come across um, when you're walking in the woods is polypores. Uh, these are very hard mushrooms. They are often called like conchs um, or bracket fungi. They are usually growing either on the side of trees or on dead decaying logs um, or like sticks that have fallen. The way you identify these mushrooms is that if you flip over them, they have pores on the underside, which is basically just tiny holes or tubes. Um, they're usually tough and hard and leathery. Uh, some have a stalk um, or a stem, but many are stalkless. And they usually grow on wood, like I said, but some do grow from the soil or hummus. This is a pretty popular mushroom. Um, it's a, in the species of reishi, uh, Ganoderma sugi. This is the hemlock vanishing cell, shelf. Um, it's found exclusively on hemlocks. Um, they can grow to be quite big over time. Um, and they're usually found in the spring through fall. They're kidney shaped dark red to orange and on the underside it is white but it can bruise brown when you touch it or scrape it and they usually don't have a stem they're kind of just growing straight off the tree they are edible but not in the sense of you're going to cook this mushroom in a pan with some butter they are more something you would dry out in powder um, to either you know mix that powder in with a drink or make tea um, they're very medicinal, this mushroom. They're very good for your immune system and they leave a brown spore print. This is another good one, um, Fomis fomentatrius. This is um, a tough perennial found on standing or fallen hardwoods. They are hoof shaped and they are grayish brown. And Historically, they've actually been used as tinder um, and hollowed out to carry fire um, through our evolutionary history. So these mushrooms are kind of cool in that sense and have been really important um, in human evolution. Uh, they are edible. Um, if you dry them out and powder them, they can be medicinal and they drop a white spore print. This is a very, very abundant mushroom. Um, it's found year round on decaying stumps. Um, I always see this when I'm walking around. It's called Serena unicolor. Uh, it can be mistaken for turkey tail, um, which is um, a mushroom that most people know, but this has an upper surface that is fuzzy and usually green from algae growing on it. The underside is whitish to gray and has a maze-like surface that can become tooth-like over time. So usually when you flip these guys over, they kind of have like these little teeth, if you will, hanging from them. They are kidney or fan-shaped uh, year round on dead hardwoods um, and they are not edible. They're just, you know, there to be there. And they drop a white spore print. And then this is the real turkey tail, Tramites versicolor, um, another favorite, um, just because this mushroom has so many different colors um, and is quite beautiful. They kind of come in like this bluish to purple, grayish color. They can be reddish orange with even golden bands. Uh, they are the one of the most common mushrooms in North America, often found on hardwood logs and stumps year round. Um, their cap colors, like I said, are highly variable, but are usually buff brown, bluish purple, or brownish red. They create zones that alternate color and texture. Um, they kind of go, also they are fuzzy and then smooth. So you gotta kind of like take a close look at these mushrooms um, to see the little hairs and stuff like that on them. And if you flip them over, um, they are very porous, you'll see thousands of little holes in them. And they are edible. Uh, many people make tea 
Um, with this one, it's very easy to just boil water and then strain them and makes a delicious tea. Um, also highly medicinal and they drop a white spore print. Uh, this is the birch polypore, uh, Fomentopsis betulina, um, another pretty common mushroom and easy to identify because they grow almost exclusively on birch trees, um, either on living birch trees or parasitic on logs that have fallen over. The caps are brownish to white uh, with a underside that is white as well, but will turn brown with age. They grow annually um, and are usually found in the late summer all through the fall. They again can be dried and made into a powder, stuff like that. Another edible um, or medicinal mushroom and they drop a white spore print. This mushroom I found a lot um, right outside my house all the time. It just grow from the ground um, in big clusters. Crotricia perennis. Um, they kind of have a cool shape to them as well. Uh, a funnel like shape and then like turkey tail, they kind of have these alternating bands as well. Um, they're common through the summer and into the fall. Uh, the cap is also velvety. They are a little bit bigger than another lookalike, um, Clotricia cinnamomia, um, but they have a duller brown color. They are often found near burn sites um, and conifers. They are not edible and they have a yellow brown spore print. They're usually found um, sometimes like in wood chips or even moss. But like I said, like sometimes you can just find them right outside your house. Uh, this is another pretty common mushroom called chicken of the woods. Um, they're common through May and no May through November. Uh, and they are distinctive in that they have this very bright yellow orange color. Um, if you find them, you usually find a lot. Um, they grow in these big clusters on the side of trees, especially oaks. Um, they're edible, of course. Um, some people say they taste like chicken, but they're just a really good mushroom to forage for and good for beginners as well. Um, and they drop a white spore print. Another large group of mushrooms um, are the bolites. Uh, these can look like gilled mushrooms, um, but they have a fleshy um, underside that is almost um, similar to a sponge. Uh, they are typically, typically found from soil, but um, also grow um, right underside uh, conifers and hardwoods. Um, their stems have scales, um, which kind of makes them distinctive in that sense. It almost makes like a web-like pattern on the ends. Um, this mushroom I find a lot, Swellus pictus. Um, it's this reddish orange bolete that grows either from the stumps of trees or right on living ones. It really likes the Eastern white pine. Um, it has a mycorrhizal relationship with that one. And it's found in June through October. So pretty long season. It has a wide to convex cap and can be pink to dark red with these scales or patches on the top. The underside is yellow, um, has a pretty thick stem. And this one is actually edible. I've never eaten this one, but you could. Um, and this one leaves a brown spore print. This one is known as the bitter bully. Um, so it's edible, but really not recommended. It tastes pretty bad. Um, it's mycorrhizal with conifers and it grows in the summer through fall. Uh, it has a brown to tan cap um, with a white underside that becomes pinkish with age. I was finding this mushroom a lot um, this past summer. It has a thick stem and it has that net like um, markings on the stem that you can see that are pretty dark brown that run all the way down the stem. And this one has a brownish to pink spore print. 
This is another common one, um, Boletus billy. Uh, this one is actually known to be only found on Cape Cod, like all through North America. Um, they've really only found it, the true one on Cape Cod. It has a wide, dark brown cap that can actually become very dark in time, almost black when it gets older has yellow flesh on the underside and it stains blue when you cut it. It um, has a red thick stalk um, and is found primarily in September in the sandy soil. It's mycorrhizal with bare oak and pitch pine and sometimes it can be found near blueberries. This one has a brown spore print and the edibility is unknown to my knowledge. Another group of fungi that I want to include um, because it's not really something I feel like you would think of when you think of mushrooms, um, jelly fungi. These guys are found year round um, and they are rubbery or squishy. Um, they're usually found on decaying wood and logs um, right on the forest floor. Uh, one you might find is known as witch's butter. This is a yellow um, jelly fungi that is found on various hardwoods through all seasons. Um, has a very bright yellow um, color and people describe it as brain-like. Um, and this one is actually edible. I've never tried it, but I know a couple of people who make candies out of this. There's actually some recipes online. Um, so this is a cool one because not many people would look at this and think you could eat it. Uh, this is another uh, one that is pretty beautiful. Um, if you see this, it's kind of cool. Um, it has this really nice purple color. It's called Flea Biopsis Cressa. It's known as a crust fungi. Um, it's in the same group really as jelly fungi. Um, and again, this is one that grows on decaying wood, um, mostly hardwoods. Uh, very common in the fall and is fairly smooth with fuzzy edges and can develop small cracks with age. Um, usually this bright purple color when fresh, but can become a little brownish purple with age. Um, and this one is not edible. It's just kind of cool to look at. Another big group of mushrooms are known as the puffballs. Um, some of these are pretty good edibles. Um, they are ball shaped and can be very small like a golf ball or even as big as a watermelon. They grow on decaying wood or soil. Uh, some that you might find here are on Cape Cod, uh, Lycoperdon pyroform. Uh, this is very common in the summer through fall usually found on decaying hardwoods or conifers. And it is actually white when it's young, but becomes reddish brown with age, like in this picture. And it is edible when it's still white and young, but after it's kind of turned this brown color, um, you wouldn't really want to forage for it. And it does have a spore print that is olive brown. Puffballs are cool because you can kind of not like crush them, but like poke them and they like the spores will just fly everywhere. Um, this one is known as the common puffball, Lycoperdon margentatum. Um, it's a white, very small puffball that usually grows on the soil, but often found near moss. Um, it really likes hardwoods and conifers. Um, common through the summer um, and into the fall and usually is white, but can become a little gray as it um, progresses. And it has little tiny hairs on it. Um, hard to see in this photo, but that's a pretty good way to ID this mushroom. Um, it has these little spines, they call it on it. And this spore print would be olive brown. Um, and like the last one, this one is edible when it's still fresh and young. Another big group of mushrooms that people love are the chanterelles um, and allies. So these ones are funnel shaped at maturity and they resemble gilled mushrooms, but they aren't technically true gills is what they say. 
Um, chanterelles have gills that run down the stem. They're not really gills, but they look like gills. Um, so the orange is like yellow picture, that's a real chanterelle. Um, and the picture next to it kind of shows how gills um, really come from the stem and lay underneath the cap. Unlike the chanterelles, the gills just kind of go all the way down the stem. That's why they're not true gills. Um, on the underside, they're more, they're more like ridges or veins um, that can join together by cross veins. Um, few of them have smooth undersides, so they're just like flat. And these guys usually grow on the ground and many are mycorrhizal with various trees. This is probably the chanterelle that you would find um, most commonly around here, Cantharellus cinnabarinus. Um, it's this flamingo pink to reddish orange color, um, kind of depressed at the center and has those false gills that run down the stem. They're mycorrhizal with hardwoods, especially beech and oaks. So if you wanted to look for this mushroom, um, go out and find some beech and oaks and there might be some underneath. These are pretty common in the summer through the fall and their seasonality kind of um, is variable. They can be very common some years or sometimes completely absent. These ones are edible um, and many people really, really like these ones. Um, and they leave a whitish pink spore color. This is known as the black trumpet. Uh, very easy to ID. There's really no lookalikes to this, um, but it can be hard to spot sometimes because often there's like a lot of leaves around them and stuff like that. And they are black, so they might blend in with, you know, fallen leaves. Um, but they have this vase shaped color, um, or not color, vase shape in a black color. Um, and they're called the black trumpet because they kind of look like a horn. Um, these guys are mycorrhizal with oaks, um, and they are often found near mossy areas as well, um, and a very popular edible. And they have a pinkish to buff spore print. Another group of fungi that I see a lot are called coral fungi. Um, they really resemble coral that you would find in the ocean. They have repeatedly branched stalks and they grow from the ground or decaying wood or on the bark of trees, kind of have um, a variety of habitats. Uh, this mushroom I found a decent amount of times um, around here in Plymouth on some trails, Claveria uh, fusiformis. Um, it's called the gold, golden spindle, I believe. Um, very bright yellow color, can grow in dense, clusters. So you might find a lot of them or just find a few. Um, in this case, I only found a few, um, but they really like hardwoods and conifers. Um, they even grow in the grass sometimes, usually found in the summer, but go all through the fall. And they have a pointed tip that kind of is darker. So they're usually yellow. And then the tip is kind of like a dark orange. Um, they leave a white spore print. Um, and these ones are not edible. Um, another very common one you can find on Cape Cod is Clavulina cineraria. Um, these ones are especially found on their conifers and in the late summer through October. They are white when they're young, but are usually found at this like grayish color with these black tips. Um, white spore print and these ones are edible. I've never eaten a coral mushroom, but they could be eaten. And this is another one I see a lot. Um, I haven't ID'd this mushroom yet because some of the coral mushrooms look very similar and have a very similar, you know, yellowish to pale yellow color. But this one is definitely um, in the Romaria genus. Um, it's found in hardwoods, usually growing from the soil um, and is common in the summer through fall. Just wanted to include this one because I do find it a lot, just not sure the exact species. 
And then another very popular um, group of mushrooms are known as the morels. Um, these guys have a very unique look to them. They have a hollow stalk with a sponge-like bell cap um, with distinct pits and ridges. Um, there's also a group called the false morels, which have a brain-like saddle-shaped or irregularly lobed cap. So in this picture, we kind of have them side by side. They have very similar textures, but the false morels usually lack um, the pits and ridges. So that's how you know you don't have a true morel. And there's really only one species of morel that I know of or that I've seen in the Cape Cod um, field guides, Marcella escalenta. This is the morel you would find in these areas. Um, very popular, edible, found in April through June, has a variety of habitats, but is usually found near dead elms, old apple orchards, burned areas in particular, um, and sometimes is found under conifers or in disturbed soil or gardens. Um, this one would leave a white spore print. And then I just wanted to include um, some tips for when you're going out and looking for these mushrooms. Um, the peak season in New England is April through November. So if you want to see mushrooms, that's a pretty good time frame to do it. Um, it's good to have baskets, um, one to carry your mushrooms, but you're also spreading spores as you walk um, because obviously baskets have, you know, they're breathable, they have holes in them. So um, once you pick a mushroom, you're still spreading its spores um, while you walk through the trail. Um, and it's better to use baskets or paper bags and not plastic if you wanna keep the mushrooms fresh. Um, obviously in the plastic, humidity would uh, be a factor and the mushrooms would go bad pretty quick. Um, it's very useful to keep track of your location the habitat you're in and the nearby trees that you see when you're foraging. One, so if you're going to, you know, ID mushrooms when you get back home, it's very good to probably just either write down or even better, just take a picture of the whole habitat that you found each mushroom in. So you can have that information when you go back and you want to identify. Because like I noted with all those species of mushrooms, they usually have particular trees or types of trees that they grow near. And when you're looking at field guides and stuff like that, they're going to include which trees would be near this mushroom. And with the lookalikes and stuff like that, it just becomes a very important factor. So take pictures of the habitat and take good pictures of the mushroom not just one picture, you really wanna get the cap and the underside of the cap, maybe the length of the stem, stuff like that. And then respectful foraging. When you go out, um, it's really good to not disturb the soil or the habitat you're foraging at. Just be careful. Um, most people carry around like a foraging knife. And if um, say like a mushroom is growing out of the ground, you're just gonna kind of cut at the bottom of the stem and not really like dig out the whole mushroom. So you're not really disrupting like the mycelium and stuff like that. And I think it's really per, um, important to really just collect for personal use, um, just like forage for you or your family, stuff like that, not for sale or profit. This can really lead to over harvesting. Um, it's cool to like have wildly foraged mushrooms say at like a farmer's market but when you have a bunch of people going out to collect pounds and pounds of mushrooms um, you're really disrupting the habitat and you could be disrupting um, the genetic diversity of mushrooms because you're not if you're really going out for profit you're probably just picking anything you can see and you're probably not really caring too much about say the life cycle of the mushroom uh, we really want to leave the mushrooms out at least long enough so that they, they can drop some spores and repopulate. Um, we want the fungi to reach near maturity so they have time to release those spores. Um, and like I said, repopulate. Over harvesting really can just impact the health of species. So a good rule of thumb is 
you really want to only take maybe like 50% of what you see, leave 50% or more um, so that you're not disrupting the habitat and so that other people who want to forage or just see these mushrooms, there's still some out there. And I want to emphasize how important it is to contribute any data you collect. And that might sound like a big task, but um, data is really easy to collect for mushrooms. And usually anyone who forages, they're collecting data and just don't really know it sometimes. Uh, pictures can be very beneficial to other mycologists and foragers online. So even if you're just taking a picture for you, it's always a great idea to post them to websites like Mushroom Observer or iNaturalist so that the information is out there. Um, usually your phone or camera kind of picks up on your um, location sometimes and time. So these, when you post the picture, it'll already say like the date and stuff like that. So you're kind of contributing to a database of, you know, when these mushrooms are out there, which ones were common in this month, stuff like that, that, you know, some people are really looking at that data um, to gain more information. Um, it's really important to collect samples <clears throat> and spore prints, um, either for you to help with your identification process or if you're willing to, um, it's a great thing to pass along your samples to people like me. Um, like I said, I opened a lab at the Center Hill Preserve. So I think as the mushroom season kind of starts, I would, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna kind of like make a drop box. So if anyone was out foraging and sees like a cool mushroom, they either wanna share with me or saw a mushroom and don't know what it was, uh, you would have the opportunity to come drop it off and I could um, look at it, do spore prints, maybe pop it under the microscope, stuff like that, um, and get a little bit more information because there's a lot to learn from these guys. And um, sometimes mushrooms are not seen for a really long time, but if the environmental factors are the right, species can pop up, especially if we have like a very rainy season species can pop up that we haven't seen in years. So keeping track of um, pictures and dates and times, locations, stuff like that, very important. Um, and a lot of people would benefit if you were to post them online. Uh, these are some of my sources. Um, a great field guide to have if you are looking for mushrooms in this area, mushrooms of Cape Cod and the National Seashore. And yeah, that's... Um, that's basically it. I would really love if there was any questions or comments um, from the audience. Uh, can you, um, well, leave your screen up. I guess I'm a bit of a loss to know how to get people who, who can ask questions with your screen up. I don't know if we'll go back to any of those. Um, maybe we can do that if you can. Can you take your screen down so we can see people? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Stop I, I have a question to start it off. I'm wondering why oaks, why conifers, why not the maples and the ash and some of the other trees? What What is it particularly about the types of trees that encourage the mushrooms and those that discourage them. Do you have do you have any sense of that? It really just depends. Um, I think particularly in this region, it's a lot of the oaks um, and pine trees, but definitely there are tons of mushrooms that have um, relationship is more of like the softwoods and the maples and stuff like that. It just depends on the location. Um, and many mushrooms have mycorrhizal relationships with various types of trees. It's just some are more common um, than others, I guess. But I'm not actually really sure um, if there's a reason why the mushrooms pick what species of trees. I, I'll actually really have to look into that. I haven't gotten that question before. I have a question from Paul Denencourt, and he asks, are any of the edibles eaten raw? Should they always be cooked? Yeah, definitely always cook them. Um, can't on the top of my head think of any that are eaten raw besides the ones that you dry out and make teas and stuff. 
but usually a rule of thumb is to cook all mushrooms um, and actually cooking them with that little bit of heat. You don't want to like overcook or burn them, but the heat actually brings out a lot of the medicinal compounds that you want to get. So it's always good to cook them. Yeah. And some of them you have to cook more thoroughly than others, like the honey mushroom. If anybody has questions, you can either get to me on monitoring chat, but if you want to put your raise your hand or just kind of cut in. Ramona, do you have a question? Go for it. We have an oak tree that gets chicken of the woods on the side of it. Mm -hmm. Does that indicate that the tree is starting to die or that it's rotting? It's so fairly high above the ground. It's probably five feet above the ground where it grows. Oh, really? Um... I forget if the uh, chicken of the woods cause uh, like rot in the wood. I don't think they do. Um, often they are found on dead decaying trees. So that might be kind of a sign that it's maybe not doing as well, but I'm pretty sure they can live on per perfectly healthy trees as well. Nick, I'm wondering yeah. if you're gonna ask about mat Matsutakis. <laughs> Nick, no? <laughs> yes some of them i didn't include just because i personally haven't found them or haven't found them in abundance so but i know those are ones that are pretty sought out as well yeah people uh go to their graves with that secret intact they're pretty yeah we've exactly been, we've been looking for we've been looking for them here but we haven't found them yet so are there any yeah. any other questions I don't see any. Somebody jump up and down if you want to ask a question so I can see you. Well, I'm just fascinated by the chemistry of these things. Uh, I'm glad that you're digging into it. And I'm wondering if you're thinking of getting more involved in the medicinal aspect. Because there's there's got to be a lot of hidden secrets there that maybe Native Americans would know or uh, maybe even the medical profession, right, Paul? I don't, I don't know. They, there's, there's certainly some interesting chemistry, but I had one more question and that is, it's, it's of interest to me why when they're young, the plants are, the, the plants are edible, but as they get older and maybe change color, they're not so. And is that a decay or is that a, just some chemistry change? that is creating the toxin that uh, prevents them from being eaten at that stage. Yeah, it has a little bit to do with decay. Um, and then honestly, it's more, I think about like choice edibility as they grow older, um, they're dropping more spores. And when they start to sporulate, um, their taste can change and probably goes from good to not so good um, taste. So I don't think it's a toxin, it's more of just about when you want to taste. eat it for the best taste, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, um, if there are no further questions, I really learned a lot and I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's neat that it's to, tied to our region. And I wanna thank Jerry for, for uh, the program. I wanna thank Beth for bailing me out a couple of times already. And um, all of you for being forgiving <laughs> of the whatever mistake we made with, with sending the uh, notice out. Thanks for being persistent. I, I think it was definitely worth it, Aaron. So keep up yes, the good yeah. work. Thanks, Aaron. That was interesting. It really was. And I also want to thank Martha because it was Martha Sheldon who passed your name on to me. She bumped into you while they were out walking last fall. and. I guess got interested talking to you and said, "Oh, you might want to contact him." You know, so that it's always good to to have. I think it's fun to learn more about what else is in our in our environment here, especially our our pine barrens. But thank you so much. This was really delightful, very informative. Yeah, okay. I'm glad. Good I'm night. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Aaron. You. That was a great presentation. Yeah, we, we we really learned a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good one, guys. You too.
Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. And uh, night. I'll get this. I'll get the uh, recording to you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Me too, Dan. Take yeah. care. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Beth. Sure. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Nick. Good night, Kristen. Hey, Kristen. Night, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> night, guys.